Good afternoon, and today we're going to talk about nucleic acid biochemistry and its diagnostic applications. I'm Nam Tran, junior faculty in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of California, Davis, and also a K30 mentored clinical research training program scholar with the Division of Burn Surgery. Our learning objectives are, first, understand the basic, basics underlying nucleic acid biochemistry. Next, understand the principles of common nucleic acid amplification testing methods. And then identify common nucleic acid targets for diagnostics. And lastly, understand the clinical impact of molecular detection methods. First, a little bit of review, and this is, of course, the central dogma of molecular biology is how we understood it back in 1970. However, of course, this has been modified since then. But in short, the dogma states that we go from DNA via transcription to RNA. So this is your messenger RNA, and then ultimately get to a protein. And there's no mechanism to go backwards or laterally. However, as you can see here on the slide, since then we've learned that there are things such as reverse transcriptase that can actually convert a positive sense RNA strand back to DNA, such as in retroviruses. And we can also have positive sense RNA via RNA replication, turning to negative sense RNA, and going back again to positive sense RNA through various mechanisms. And we also now see various other types of RNAs playing a role in molecular biology, including microRNAs, and that's something we'll talk more about in today's presentation. This slide shows the structure of nucleic acids. We, of course, have ribonucleic acid, or rRNA, or deoxyribonucleic acids, or DNA. Typically, DNA has a double-stranded structure, especially in eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and this is a right-handed double helix and you can see a phosphate backbone going up the, the side. Of course, this was elucidated by Watson and Crick during the late 60s. RNA, however, typically is in a single-strand format. However, there are double-stranded versions of RNA, especially in viruses. And you can see that the difference between the two, other than if they're double-stranded or single-stranded, is the fact that their base pairs are also different. We, of course, have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine in DNA. However, in RNA, the thymine is actually replaced by uracil. And so these differences are what make the biochemistry of these nucleic acids so different from each other. For DNA, which is somewhat analogous to RNA-based pairing when that occurs, DNA-based pairing is based on hydrogen bonds. And so a complementary strand of DNA will pair up based on specific nucleotides that must pair with each other, such as guanine with cytosine or adenine with thymine. And the differences between these hydrogen bonds is that guanine and cytosine, or GC pairing, you see that there's actually three hydrogen bonds shown here in the top right, whereas adenine and thymine only have two hydrogen bonds. Of course, the thermodynamics that are involved with this will be different between these two types of pairings, and thus the bonds, the structures that keep the guanine and cytosine together are much stronger and therefore to separate GC bonds, hydrogen bonds, requires a lot more energy than AT base pairs. And this is something that's uh, important to realize as we talk about nucleic acid amplification methods. So with that, we're going to change gears and talk about how we test for nucleic acids and go through a variety of both uh, past, current, and future methods for detecting these molecules. So a typical nucleic acid testing process is shown here. You can see the entire detection interval shown the top in green. However, this is broken down into usually about four different steps, the first being DNA extraction, then followed by getting the reagents or the detection mix prepared, and then followed by some form of amplification, and then lastly, some form of results interpretation. So if you hear at the bottom of the figure, you see some sample containing various kinds of cells of interest, and then you get the DNA out and you run amplification, in this case PCR or polymerase chain reaction, and we'll talk more about that shortly. And then we are able to then get specific sequences of DNA out and look at through various mechanisms to identify targets or regions of interest. Now looking at each step in more detail, we're going to start first off with nucleic acid extraction. And the key question here, of course, is how do we get nucleic acids out of the cell? 
they're surrounded by some plasma membrane in some organisms such as fungi or or bacteria there's there's also cell walls and how do we actually pull the DNA out from these organisms well there's actually several methods and shown here on the left is actually a famous electron micrograph of an E. coli cell that has been lysed and all those lines on the figure are from the DNA and you can see that there's a lot of nucleic acids within these cells and the main methods of lysis can really fall under two main categories being mechanical as well as chemical mechanical lysis usually covers bead beating the French press or sonication methods and chemical lysis typically involves enzymes and detergents and this can be coupled to heat or thermal radiation to be able to accelerate the process. Let's first take a look at bead beading and you can see here in short there is a vial that contains a variety of silica particles as well as ceramic beads. You put a sample in here it could be uh, soft tissue or actually even blood and it is then placed into an agitator of some kind similar to a centrifuge but instead of spinning it shakes and actually causes these beads to come together and shear apart the variety of cells this movement coupled to the actual beads and silica particles will rip apart the cells and then lead to a very very homogenized sample at the bottom we actually have an example this is the Roche diagnostics magnalyzer system we actually have it here at our institution for a variety of variety of assays and in short you just rip apart the cells and then separate out the lysate which will separate on its own into three layers the bottom layer being the heaviest are the silica uh, silica particles and ceramic beads the middle layer is typically the area of interest especially when working with blood and the top layer is the foamy foamy remnants of the tissue and cells that you've ripped apart. So you put a pipette in and draw the middle layer out in the case of whole blood so you get what is usually the DNA targets you want. The next slide shows another form of mechanical lysis which is the French press and in short this is a container which has a method of applying high amounts of pressure to force a cell suspension through a very small orifice. So of course if you recall your physics and chemistry that when you apply a amount of force via piston or plunger in this case and you're forcing fluid through a small orifice then you'll actually have these samples go through at a very high speed. Cells are forced to shrink in size to fit through the orifice and what occurs as it pops out on the other side of the orifice, the cells prop back open to their normal size and this burst of reforming back to a normal size actually rip the cells apart and of course all this cellular content is then impacted onto a plate and you can collect that and use it for testing. A third method of mechanical lysis is sonication. This is a very interesting method where you are hitting a sample with ultrasound, so from an ultrasonic horn. And in short, these ultrasonic waves create cavitation bubbles. These bubbles will appear and disappear and burst and so forth. And through the bursting of these bubbles adjacent to various cells causes the fluids to re fill those areas of vacuum and this leads to a variety of shearing forces that can occur and rips apart cells. There's actually also some form of thermal energy that can occur from this type of, of mechanical lysis but in short the shearing effects will rip apart these cells and leads to a pretty much a sample full of destroyed cells and of course the DNA that we are interested in. Well, of course, before having mechanical lysis, we have chemical lysis, and this is the use of detergents, enzymes, and or with heat to facilitate the destruction of these cells. And typically, the chemical lysis involves detergents such as, uh, such as uh, SDS, sodium desyl sulfide, or, or guanidine thiocyanate, which can also shake loose or emulsify the plasma membranes of variety of cells. Enzymes such as lysozyme and so forth can also aid in the process and heat of course catalyzes help uh, catalyze these reactions and of course just melt apart these cells. Now that we actually have ripped the DNA out of these cells we have to figure out how we're going to amplify the signal but to amplify the signal you have to have a pure sample so how do we get a pure sample of nucleic acids? As you can see in this simple cartoon, 
the DNA is there, but there's other junk from the actual cell amongst the sample as well. And this includes proteins, RNAs. If you're not looking for RNAs, you don't want them there. Uh, if you just want the RNA, but you don't, you don't want the DNA that's there. So there's a lot of confounding factors that are in these lice samples. So how do we actually separate what we want and throw away what we don't want? And to do this, we actually can use a variety of methods, such as the use of affinity columns, magnetic affinity beads, and electrophoretic sorting. And these are very interesting methods, which we'll go through shortly. And they pretty much harness the unique nature or unique biochemistry of nucleic acids to selectively grab nucleic acids and leave all the other molecules behind, such as proteins. So here we have an example of an affinity column. In short, you'll see that the sample sitting in a tube and the affinity column is made of a material that will change its charge when encountering different buffers. So let's hypothesize here that you were to add a buffer that led to the filter in this affinity column to become very positive. And as you recall, that DNA has a phosphate backbone and phosphate is usually negative, has a net negative charge. So you now have a negative affinity column and a target molecule that is, um, I'm sorry, uh, a affinity column that is very positive and a target molecule that's very negative. You're going to then centrifuge it and you'll find that anything that was negatively charged will be bound to this affinity column and anything else that was neutral or, or positively charged will pass right through. And in its simplest form, you remove the waste product, and now you should have a filter that contains mostly the target that you want, in this case, nucleic acids. You wash it to try to get rid of any other junk that's on the filter. And then you add another type of solvent to actually change the charge on the affinity column either to neutral or the opposite charge of the DNA, centrifuge it again, and then now you have mostly the DNA product that you want. Another method is the use of magnetic capture beads. And this is another very interesting method, very novel method of DNA purification. So let's say that we have a sample containing DNA and other compounds in it, proteins and so forth. But we've also added magnetic capture beads. And these beads can be charged and cha their charge can change relative to a pH, just like the affinity column, but they're also magnetic. You can also have magnetic beads having specific nucleotides on it or specific oligonucleotides on it that can capture specific regions of DNA too but for this example these are beads that have a charge that can um, that can change their charge relative to pH and pull negative or positively charged molecules to them. So now that we have a sample that contains these beads that are say positively charged they attract all the negatively charged DNA and then we apply a magnetic field to one side of the sample column. So all these beads will move to that side and then you can wash out everything else that's not bound to the magnetic beads. So as shown here you have all the beads bound to DNA and all the other stuff we don't want, proteins and so forth, have been removed from the system. And all you have to do is remove the magnetic field, get the beads out which are still bound to DNA, change the pH so that the DNA is released, and now you have a sample that contains the free DNA you want. Our last method of DNA purification or nucleic acid purification relies on electrophoresis. Of course, electrophoresis has been used for quite a long time and you may be familiar with this in gel electrophoresis. But in this case, you apply a potential difference across a sample and based on charge, once again, and remember DNA has a net negative charge. If you apply this, this potential difference, the DNA will be attracted to the positively charged end of the sample. And of course, you'll just collect what is what happens to be on that end, on the positive end of this electrophoretic cell. Well, congratulations. We've now been able to lyse the organisms, get the DNA, DNA out of these cellular organisms, and then we've been able to purify it. But now here comes the fun part. And that's how do we amplify the signal? Because if we're looking for one unique cell, potentially, there's not much DNA there to look at. So how do we amplify the signal to get an accurate result?
And of course, the best example that we have for nucleic acid amplification, and that's polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And this was conceived of back in the 80s by Kerry Mullis, who also received the Nobel Prize for this while he was working out of the CETUS group. And over the ages, it has evolved substantially. It actually contributed to the surge in knowledge in the field of molecular biology it has made many things possible that we now take for granted today and in short PCR relies on similar mechanisms that are used by our body to replicate DNA the problem is our body has enzymes that can help separate double-stranded DNA we don't have those enzymes and we don't have those enzymes for use in in vitro diagnostics and how do we do that well we can heat up the sample, which is an easy way to melt DNA, as they say. So heating a temperature up to, say, 94 degrees Celsius will cause double-stranded DNA to denature. Well, the problem with that is DNA polymerases, which are enzymes that are responsible for copying DNA, typical DNA polymerases that are within our E. coli cells inside our bodies, because our bodies are usually at 37 degrees Celsius, those proteins will denature and they will stop working so how do we deal with that so what enabled us to actually be able to do pcr was actually something from the bottom of the ocean and that was the bacteria that lived next to the thermal vents under the sea where temperature can be quite hot and they of course have to replicate so therefore they have enzymes that are robust to high temperatures so thermophilus aquaticus in this case and that enzyme ultimately now known as TAC TAQ and that's why we have what's called TACMAN PCR and that is now used to amplify the DNA so now we see here the schematic of PCR starting at the top first we denature that double strand piece of DNA and now we have two single strand pieces of DNA we have engineered primers which are shown in green that help bind to a specific region of nucleic acid that you're interested in and will facilitate binding of the DNA polymerase in this case TAC polymerase and then this leads to copying based on um, based on the template that we had and we've now effectively doubled the number of nucleic acids we've had. So we started with one piece of double-strand DNA. Now we have two pieces of double-strand DNA. If you were to repeat this process, and this, is, of course, is one PCR cycle, you would end up with a total amount of DNA equaling the amount you started off with times two to the number of cycles, um, number of cycles raised to that power. So you can see here n equals n naught times two raised to the c power and that's the mathematical relationship of PCR. So in short, you'll start off with very few, but you'll end up with millions upon millions of, of DNA products, especially if you run out to typically 40 cycles of PCR. And of course, you can try to do math and uh, see how much you get. Now, I do want to mention that there's many other forms of nucleic acid amplification. People have written book chapters and volumes of chapters on many other methods of PCR and there's even other types of nucleic acid amplification techniques that are out there but PCR is typically the the most commonly used method and we're going to stick with that today for this lecture now you've amplified the DNA now how do you detect the DNA and the concept of nucleic acid detection is typically how do we find a piece of DNA that we are interested in using either non-specific or specific methods so you don't want to confuse RNA when you're looking for DNA and vice versa. And you don't want to confuse a human DNA for a bacterial DNA when you're actually interested in the latter. So there are three real methods of looking at nucleic acids. The first is absorption, the second is intercalating dyes, and the third with, with hybridization probes. And we're going to talk about each of those now. Absorption is the easiest. It's easy to do in the lab because all you need is a spectrophotometer. And here, let's say we have a test tube vial containing some DNA of interest. We run PCR in it. Of course, we'll end up with millions upon millions of pieces of DNA copies or amplicons. And since DNA, the, nucleic, uh, the nu nucleotides, have an aromatic ring on it, they actually absorb at a ultraviolet range, so 260 nanometers. So based on Beer's law, the Beer-Lambert law, where absorption equals the extinction coefficient times the path length, times the concentration of that of that sample you can actually figure out how much DNA you had intercalating dyes is another method and it's been around for quite some time you can use a dye that intercalate between the base pairs 
and this leads to a fluorescence. So you have intercalating dyes such as ethidium bromide and cyber green, which are very uh, specific for double stranded DNA, and they can bind and glow. And you can see here in the top right, a gel with ethidium bromide glowing where there are DNA bands for the samples. But just like the absorption method shown previously, both these methods are not specific because all you need here are double stranded DNA. And there's, of course, other types of dyes that could be used for single strand DNA too, but Again, they're not specific to a specific gene, as an example, or a specific type of DNA. So how do we actually identify specific targets of nucleic acids? So you can see here that today we do a lot of nucleic acid testing that's specific to conditions and diseases and organisms. So you can see here for blood screening, we can look for HIV-1, hepatitis B virus, or hepatitis C virus. For cancer, we can actually do pharmacogenomics, look at various cytochrome P450 subtypes, such as uh, CYP2B6 or 2C9 and so forth, or the Philadelphia chromosome. We can look at inheritable diseases, such as the CFTR mutation for cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. Infectious diseases, again, yes, the viruses, such as HEP, HEP1, uh, HEP, um, HEP B and HEP C and HIV1 and 2, but we can also look at you know other bacteria, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, fungi even. And then last but certainly not least, we can look at injury markers, so-called DAMPS, D-A-M-P-S, or Damage Associated Molecular Patterns, and this can be attributed to um, various epigenetic changes, including with MIR, microRNAs and uh, small uh, silencing RNAs. So how do we actually look at these regions? Well, in the 90s, people were able to figure out that you can couple various nucleic acid probes so to uh, with fluorophore. So you generated chemically a small sequence of complementary DNA that can bind to a gene. And you can stick a fluorescent dye on it coupled to a quencher. So it's shown here on the right when this probe is not bound to a specific piece of DNA, it forms a secondary structure. The fluorophore and the quencher come very much closer so this molecule does not fluoresce anymore. However, upon binding to a specific region, the piece of DNA in the probe spreads out and the quencher and fluorophore become distant and now this fluorophore can fluoresce indicating the presence of that gene. We can take this to another level and we could do something called fluorescent resonance energy transfer where we use probe pairs and these probe pairs are shown here you have an anchor and sensor probe. The anchor probe is very homologous or to a region of interest. You then also have a sensor probe. The sensor probe is loosely made quote unquote, where it will have a couple of mismatches in terms of its base pairing depending on the target that it binds to. And on the anchor probe you have a fluorophore that's constitutively excited, so in this case a blue fluorophore, because the system that you're testing it in will keep illuminating it and exciting that blue fluorophore. However, the sensor probe doesn't fluoresce normally. It only fluoresces when it comes very close, pretty much adjacent to the anchor probe's fluorophore. So under very specific conditions, there has to be a region that allows both of these probes, both anchor and sensor probe, to bind very close together. And the actual vibration from the blue fluorophore on the anchor probe will cause a resonant effect, leading to the sensor probe's fluorophore to actually become fluorescent, in this case generating photons of red light which then you can detect. So you can imagine that you have an assay that looks for only red light and when these two probes come together only under the specific circumstances you detect the red light you know that gene is there. What's also very interesting with this method is since the sensor probe is less homologous to the target region and based on how many uh, how many mutations there are, how much differences between the nucleic acid of, of interest or with similar pieces of nucleic acids, this actual sensor probe can be melted off at different temperatures. So this allows us to detect differences between organisms, um, organisms within the same species but different in terms of their subspecies. So in the case of Streptococcus pyogenes versus a Streptococcus agalactiae, where differences in a specific region can be found using a sensor and anchor probe technique such as this. What's also very important with the use of these hybridization probes and now being able to melt off pieces of DNA and see the 
oligonucleotides come off and the fluorescent change in response to temperature changes, you could do what's called real-time PCR. And as the saying goes, which may not be re as relevant as it used to be, but scientists used to say that you're not doing real science until you're doing real-time PCR. And the reason being is real-time PCR allows you to quantify the amount of nucleic acids that you had. So you can see how much a body, how much something responds to a form of injury, as an example, if you're looking at RNA and translating that into actual a physiological response where proteins are being made. So you can see here that a PCR curve shown here with a y-axis and fluorescence and arbitrary units and x-axis in terms of PCR cycles and how many PCR cycles you've run. So you would guess that if you had a sample and you see here as the black line the control sample it has a sigmoidal shaped curve so you'll have an exponential phase that will go up and then you eventually run out of reagents and all the DNA products start interfering with each other and the, and the signal plateaus out. So based on what you know with PCR, if you start off with a very high amount of DNA, target DNA, of course, that signal will much will spike up much earlier. So you can see with the blue line, the S-shaped curve occurs much earlier than the black shape, uh, black S-shaped curve. And conversely, if you start off with a low concentration of DNA, then the S-shaped curve occurs much later. Many of these devices have a threshold this red dotted line right here. And when the PCR system detects that signal and the signal crosses that line, it's called the cycle threshold value or CT value. And this is a very important value because it's inversely proportional to the concentration of sample. Having said that, if you were to test a series of samples with known concentrations of nucleic acids under serial dilutions, you can now set up a standard curve. So hypothetically, if you have a standard curve and now you test an unknown sample, in this case with bacteria, and you see that the CT value that's reported by the system of 15, this pretty much shows you that it is at 4 uh, logs of bacteria. And so 4 logs of bacteria in this case is 10 to the 4 CFU per ml. And this is what we use to quantify organisms. And of course, we have to have a standard curve for this. So what does this all mean clinically? PCR is great, and I've mentioned that it's been around since the 80s and it grew and grew and made us be able to detect organisms and genes and so forth but what does it do to help patients so I want to show you a case right here this is a 20 year old man who had a motor vehicle accident with 90 percent burns um, including third and fourth degree burns as well as a neck fracture this patient came in on day one already hypotensive from their burn injury, so requiring epinephrine. I know this slide is quite busy, so I'm going to kind of cut out the unnecessary stuff and focus on the more important things. And you can see here with the timeline, we have to kind of um, make some truncations because this patient stayed for quite some time. But in short, we see that on day 27 of their stay, RCs, which are respiratory cultures, and BCs, blood cultures, were collected on day 27. The patient received voriconazole, which is an antifungal antimicrobial, and meropenem, which is a broad-spectrum antibacterial, on that day for suspicion of sepsis. This is mainly because the patient spiked the fever on that day, and this is standard protocol at our institution to start them on this broad spectrum antibiotics, especially in the burn patient population. However, what was interesting was the results for culture, both respiratory and blood, were not productive for about three days. And by day three, when these cultures reported the presence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in both samples, the patient was already in septic shock. And this is a very severe infection. The patient's mean arterial pressure, or MAP, was in the 40 and 50, uh, 40s and 50s. The patient was starting at four vasopressors to improve the patient's blood pressure, had the presence of green exudate on the wounds, uh, indicative of pseudomonas colonization, and the patient was thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 88,000 cells per microliter. So this is a very serious case. The patient did not do well and continued to progress and received more antibiotics on day 37 and 38. So they added postaconazole to improve the patient's antifungal coverage, but also added tobramycin as shown here on day 38. And tobramycin is aminoglycoside antimicrobial that helps with treating gram-negative bacteria like pseudomonas. And despite all that effort, blood cultures that were collected on day 38 showed no, the presence of no organisms and the patient died. Well, in that case, we we have no idea what was going on if it wasn't for a study that we were doing in parallel. And this was involving a 
multiplex PCR assay developed by Roche Diagnostics, and at this time this was part of a prospective observational trial, and the septifast assay, as it was called, could detect 25 different bacterial and fungal organisms, and these organisms represent the top 25 that cause sepsis. You can see here that you can also speciate between gram-positives and gram-negative bacteria and amongst the various fungi, including aspergillus, which is a mold, and the various types of Canada species. The septifast assay targeted a variety of genes this is taken straight from their uh, in international patent. And in short, they look at the 16S and 23S rib ribosomal internal transcribed spacer region or ITS region. You can see other regions shown here for, for the organism Staph aureus. But in short, this is a very conserved region amongst bacteria. And they're able to identify the organism by this region mainly because it is copied multiple times within the single bacterial genome. This, of course, was helpful because it increases the sensitivity of the assay. As shown here, the PCR probes actually bind to the ITS region, so it will bind there, help with copying the DNA via PCR, and then using FRET with anchor and sensor probes, you can then identify the organism as a specific group, so it could be just Staphylococcus species, but then with melting point analysis where you heat up the sample as shown previously, you can then identify specific subspecies such as Staph aureus. So here's the slide again of showing how fluorescent resonance energy transfer works with anchor and sensor probes and also how melting point analysis is done. Now let's take a look at this patient case again. So we see that we actually pulled PCR samples with this patient. We actually pulled a sample on day two with cultures and respiratory cultures and those were all negative which is great. And so PCR works well even when there's no the presence of none of the organisms on there. On day 27, which is the most interesting, we did pull a PCR result and we found pseudomonas. Now, having said that, how fast was our PCR assay? It was five to six hours. So we knew that the patient had pseudomonas aeruginosa on that day. So they knew about sepsis day one and potentially could have treated on day one. However, our study was observational in nature. Our assay was not FDA approved and so it was blind to the clinicians. So we saw that but what was even more interesting was day 38. Blood cultures were negative however the PCR was still reporting pseudomonas aeruginosa which is fascinating because it could suggest that with all the antibiotics on board and the patient doing worse the antibiotics may have inhibited growth in these blood cultures at the time and those antibiotics that uh, the antibiotics we were using did target the organism and the blood cultures we used at the time did not contain any antimicrobial sequestering reagents so the antibiotics could prevent the growth in blood cultures given a false negative result and PCR detected that. Conversely playing devil's advocate we can also suggest that PCR may not have detected whole organisms it could be a false positive, quote unquote, in that case where PCR may have detected destroyed bacteria. Remember, PCR only detects the nucleic acids. So this is a quite an interesting result for us. But at the minimum, on day 27, our method could have accelerated targeted therapy much earlier. Well, the big question is, how does PCR impact patient care? Because I showed you a case where, yes, we knew what was going on. We could detect things faster, but we could not treat based on these fast results. So let's move on to our next case study. This is based on a new, newer PCR assay and from a company called Cepheid and using their MRSA and Staph aureus test. We're going to focus on Staph aureus mainly because the organism is highly prevalent, is a public health concern. There are resistance, resistant forms that lead to methicillin-resistant strains, and that's usually associated with higher mortality. And genetically, how we differentiate different forms of Staphylococcus species are shown here by this Venn diagram in the big circle shown in yellow. You have all organisms in the Staphylococcus species that carry the SPA gene, which encodes for protein A. This is Staph aureus. This is our friend Staph aureus that we all know well. Alternately, in the gray circle shown, uh, shown around the middle, that's those are the organisms that don't carry the SPA gene but still fall under the Staphylococcus species. These are your coagulase negative staph. Now, this gray circle also represents organisms that carry the MECA gene. The MECA gene is the gene that typically leads to methicillin resistance. So the overlap between the gray circle and the yellow circle, now shown in red, are MRSA. So they carry both the SPA gene and the MECA gene. You can differentiate them much further because there's different cassettes 
So the mech aging sits within a very molar region, and these are SCC mech regions, staphylococcal chromos uh, cassette chromosome regions, and different subtypes of this can be uh, can be found, and they typically can help us stratify MRSA for from the community versus the hospital. And of course, this is somewhat of a gray zone because of uh, the differences between these organisms. And there's other genes that may be of interest, including the Van, uh, van gene, which could be transferred between organisms, conferring vancomycin resistance, so, so a key drug used for treating MRSA. And the PVL gene, uh, which is what we worry about in terms of a toxin that could be released specifically from community-acquired MRSA. Well, the organisms that don't have the SPA region or don't have the MECA region, and they are still part of Staph aureus, these are the coag negative staph that aren't methicillin resistant. So those are in existence too and shown here in the light blue. So this is the system we're using. This is the Cepheid Gene Expert system. It uses, of course, real-time PCR. The best part is, is it's FDA approved. It's semi-automated. It allows us to pretty much take a sample, put it into a test cartridge and plug it into the instrument and press start. And in 70 minutes, we can find results. And that's much faster, but it does test from blood culture and swab samples. In contrast, the Septifast system actually tested from whole blood. So a little bit of a difference, but still useful for us clinically. How the Gene Expert system looks at the Staph aureus genome, it actually looks at the SPA region, the open reading frame X region, and also the uh, the actual MECA gene. So looking at these three areas allows the assay to not only identify Staphylococcus aureus species, but also differentiate with um, resistant strains such as MRSA. So the clinical performance of the Cepheid system is shown here, published in 2009. And you can see that its swab tests for nasal colonization and skin soft tissue infections are quite good in the 90s in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values, but also its blood culture tests for differentiating between MRSA and MSSA. Here's a closer look of the Gene Expert test cartridge. So in short, it has effectively miniaturized what we do with pipettes and biosafety cabinets into a very small handheld disposable cartridge. And effectively, it uses a rotating valve to be able to transfer fluids between chambers. The movement of the fluid is facilitated by a plunger within the instrument. And different chambers with, within this test cartridge simulates the pipetting steps. And ultimately, the sample, once it has purified its uh, DNA after sonication, it then moves the DNA targets as well as the PCR reagents into a detection window, and it runs PCR over that time period. So here we see the actual methods for testing with the Gene Expert system. It has this company, Cepheid, has since moved on from these sample types to test other types of organisms, including Clostridium difficile from stool samples, enteroviruses, and various genetic diseases as well, including for those for coagula co uh, coagulation issues. And you can see here for the nasal system, you can do a swab, you can do a swab from a wound, and you can do samples from positive blood cultures. In short, from these three sample types, when looking at Staph aureus, you'll get results in 60 to 70 minutes. This leads us into a currently ongoing clinical trial titled Rapid Quantitative PCR-Based Detection of Staph Aureus in Burn Sepsis Patients. This project is supported by the American Burn Association as well as the Department of Defense. This is a randomized controlled trial where we look at adult patients with 20% or more burns and randomizing about 240 of these patients one-to-one -to, -one to either receive standard of care uh, culturing with standard of care treatment or to the experimental group where they received standard of care culturing and treatment but also ha also augmented by our PCR test for Staph aureus. So in short, one group will receive just faster results for Staph aureus infections only. This is also a multi-center trial. We actually have four burn centers currently active right now, including UC Davis, also University of Cincinnati, University of Miami, and the University of Washington, and we're having two more sites going online shortly. So how useful is this assay? Well, number one, our test is faster, but remember, we're using real-time PCR, so in theory, we can potentially quantify the amount of organisms there. And for our study, the quantification is blinded. So here we have a four-year-old man with 20% total body surface area burns to the face, head, neck, upper left upper back, bilateral hands, and lower left extremity from a house fire. On day five, the patient looked like 
they were getting septic, so blood cultures, respiratory cultures, and wound cultures were collected, and they were start empirically on vancomycin. We were able to get a wound swab sample at the same time as the wound culture that was collected, and we were able to report back very quickly that there was methicillin sensitive staph virus or MSSA but we were also able to quantify the amount of organism there that um, that was on that swab so so we saw we saw that it was about 1029 CFUs of the organism on day six treatment did not start yet and that was pretty much reported quickly on real time to the clinicians but they decided not to start we see that the number of organisms actually rose to some small amount and once treatment was started we now go to day seven culture still at this time didn't report anything and ultimately by 9 34 in the morning finally reported that there was some gram positive cocci which is very not specific but we did see a significant reduction in the number of organisms on the wound and this is very pleasing to us because this was trending with treatment on day eight, the cultures, the wound cultures reported the presence of staph aureus, but the resistance testing was pending, and we continued to see a decrease in the number of organisms. And lastly, on day nine, wound cultures finally reported the same results we've had for the last four days. So in short, PCR testing provided definitive results four days faster than culture, and quantitative PCR correlated with treatment efficacy. And of course, just as a reminder, our quantitative PCR was blinded to the clinicians. So have we solve the issue of sepsis we of course have not and where do we go from here because pcr seems interesting but what can we really do with these technologies well the first question is how much can we detect with pcr the inherent limitation of pcr is it can only detect based on what you design the assay to find so if you can only detect 25 organisms with septifast well if you found there was another organism that was on your test menu, you're never going to find it. That's why culture is still a useful method, because in theory, it will detect all culturable organisms. So how do we make PCR systems multiplex more? And what is really the limit of multiplexing? So our assay with Septifaz was 25, but this paper that was published in 2010 using actually the gene expert system was able to show that one could multiplex up to 119 different organisms. This is huge. And so show, I'll show you the next slide. This next slide shows the list of organisms, the 119 that the assay from these investigators was able to detect. It's quite profound. And so it's very interesting that we now have PCR assays that could detect so much. However, is it possible to detect nucleic acids without really having to amplify or use fluorescent probes? Well, the, the uh, answer to that question is actually yes. There's been a technology since 2008, what we originally um, uh, found to be called Diagnostic Magnetic Resonance, or DMR. And this really uses, uses T2 time T2 time nuclear magnetic resonance. So for a little bit of a refresher, the T2 time is the spin spin relaxation time in nuclear, nuclear magnetic resonance. And without having to jump into the physics behind this, in short, the NMR method, when coupled to magnetic nanoparticles that have specific affinity ligands, and these can be nucleic acids, oligonucleotides that bind to target nucleic acids, or antibodies that can bind to structures including cells, well, in the presence of our targets, these magnetic nanoparticles will cluster together. And the clustering then causes the change in the organization of the water that's in the sample and of course hydrogen or proton NMR is very sensitive to the changes in the locations of water molecules and this is a very sensitive method for detection. This picture here shows a example of a potential DMR based method. It uses a very small NMR system similar to what investigators use in animal studies for MRI and so forth so they have a permanent magnet uh, neodymium magnet to generate the magnetic field and so forth and a small microcoil array and then microfluidics actually draw the sample in for processing and testing since then the company T2 Biosystems which were the originators of these uh, technologies have developed a system which uh, we're eager to see um, go through the FDA process which could potentially detect five species of Canada uh, from from a variety of samples in as little as two hours. If you recall fungal organisms are very slow growing so if you accelerate treatment and detection this is potentially beneficial.
Well, in conclusion, we can see that modern molecular biology has moved definitely from um, beyond the central dogma, the uh, central dogma that we originally proposed, and and we see that reverse transcriptase microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, are now challenging this paradigm. Nucleic acid testing requires efficient cellulosis, extraction, and purification to facilitate successful amplification. Nucleic acid detection can be accomplished through absorption, intercalating in dyes, or by use using fluorescent hybridization probes. And with more advanced methods with fluorescent hybridization probes, we can use melting point analysis with real-time PCR to be able to differentiate between molecular targets, but also quantify what type of organisms and targets that are there. And thus, molecular pathogen detection enhances management of conditions such as sepsis, and it could help determine treatment efficacy, especially by quantifying the amount of nucleic acids that are there, and this is useful, of course, in pathogen treatment, and in terms of how much is, how many organisms are there in vitro.